Did it pop up and say? That's interesting. It didn't for me. I haven't recorded in ages, so it doesn't tell me that it's being recorded, but I'm glad it told you guys. Okay, so um, I'm, I know we're all here and very excited today to hear all about all the unmentionables. Um, we realized that we hadn't had a session that was um, from some of our committee members since we kicked it off and we thought it might be a fun one to give them free reign to ramble on about one of their favorite subjects and in some cases possibly one of their favorite pet peeves. Um, <laughs> so that is what we are doing today and I'm trying to think about it's been a while since I've hosted the which is why Veronica has been helping me out nicely. It, although I did the Christmas party, but that was a bit different. And thanks everyone who came. That was really good fun um, to our Christmas event. But in terms of housekeeping, you all know where your own um, restrooms are and your emergency exits. So I can't help you out with that. Um, but it is a fairly secure meeting. So we don't expect any of those weird Zoom intruders, but we've got loads of co-hosts in case anything goes awry. Um, we do welcome you to use the chat. Like we said, please go ahead. I see people wonderful. Frederica's here from Dresden. Um, we've got lots of regulars coming in, but we've got lots of new people. So please share where you're from in the chat. And as we go through, um, Suzanne is co-hosting with me today and she will also be helping out with the questions. Um, the format for this is we have a speaker speaking for about 10 minutes and then we have time for questions. Um, we can always have some general discussion at the end, but please feel free to go ahead and put your questions in the chat as we go along, because we will be monitoring them and then we'll be ready to go with questions when our talks complete. I think that's it. Um, so without much further ado, I am going to introduce our very first speaker today, who is the lovely, wonderful Dr. Veronica Isaac. And let's face it, everyone here is lovely, wonderful. So I'll try to either, if I don't, if I don't remember to qualify that with the other speakers, there's no favoritism here. Um, you're all amazing. Okay, <laughs> Veronica. Um, Veronica is a material cultural historian who specializes in the history of 19th century dress and theater costume. She is a curatorial consultant and the university lecturer and is currently working at the University of Brighton, London College of Fashion and New York University, London. This paper has emerged from our ongoing investigations into the development of costuming practices during 19th century theater, specifically her recent work with a collection of costumes worn by Kitty Lord, now held in the Museum of, Mon of London, and her talk is seductively rounded and padded to perfection taking a closer look at Kitty Lord's symmetricals. Brilliant, thank you, Robin. Um, thank you everyone today for letting me take you, um, I guess, behind um, the scenes within Kitty Lord's wardrobe. And I will start by introducing you to Kitty Lord. Um, her actual name was Kate Burbage, but who doesn't love a stage persona? Um, she was born about 1883 from what I can gather. And the peak of her career was in from about the mid 1890s through into the 1900s until she retired in 1915. And she started off in London and in many of the major music halls um, in that period, she appeared on the stage, but she also toured to South America, to Cairo, um, to Paris and to Naples. And on most of the photographs that I found of her at the sort of peak of her career and which match up with the costumes I'll be discussing, she's described as in French. She gets the French title of Chantal's eccentrique anglaise. So the eccentric English singer. Um, and I haven't done the level and depth of research I'd like to do in her career, but from what I can gather, from what I have read, she sort of specialized in comic songs, a bit of dancing and, in the Museum of London, there is also a tickling stick that may have formed part of her act. What role that performed, I leave to your own conjecture. Uh, you can ponder on that as I carry on with this presentation. Um, what inspired me to look more closely at her um, is actually the tights you're seeing on the right hand side, or at least my right hand side of the screen. This, they are turned inside out in this picture and that's very deliberate. It's so you can see the padding that is covering the thighs and the calves. I think you can just about see the padding on the calves of these tights. Um, they sort of got a, they're, they're knitted. Um, it's wool at the top and then it's silk from sort of the thigh down. And it's those tights that have, are giving her that really full voluptuous um, leg silhouette you're seeing 
in the photographs. And if you want to see these photographs in more depth, um, if you go to the Harvard um, Library online, you can actually zoom in really, really close. And I love it because you can see even the tiny wrinkles on her knees, as you can see on this image here, because although knitting um, does give you a level of stretch, it's not the kind of elasticity you'd expect from sort of modern fabrics. And that padding also has to be placed really precisely so that it looks natural and realistic. Um, so I thought I'd start by transporting you very briefly to the world in which these tights are having their performance and where they matter. So as I said, Kitty Lord is a music hall singer and dancer, and she's performing initially, at least, on the London stage. And I suspect this is where the, those kind of types had their debut. And the music hall changes dramatically over the course of the 19th century. At the beginning, it's quite raucous in the sort of 1830s, 1840s time. There's supper rooms. It's very informal. You just get up, you do your piece and you leave and people are paying a penny to come in. And, you know, you're drinking, you're eating throughout. And maybe some of that drink ends up on the performer if it's a particularly bad performance. But as we go through the 19th century, the music hall kind of crystallizes as a performance space. The people who attend are very mixed. It's got a reputation as being kind of a working class area for entertainment. But actually, there was a, a real blend of classes, primarily male, though. <laughs> women would attend, women could attend, but the kind of women who tended to go there would either be with a husband or with a man who was their custodian for that evening. Um, and you can get a sense of the kind of different qualities of musical entertainments you might encounter by the number of trouser buttons that have been discovered in the Glasgow Panopticon um, during the course of the redisplay. So I'll just leave that again to your, to your mind as we go forward. Um, but the key shift that happens by the 1890s when Kitty's Lord's career is taking off is that the music halls become places where people are investing a lot of money in the entertainment space. Auditoriums are being completely refurbished from the 1880s onwards. They have gilt um, being covering the walls. The walls are being painted sort of dark egg blue. There are these opulent proscenium arches and they're installing electricity and electric lighting throughout, both in the auditorium and on the stage. And many of them, including the Tivoli, where she performed in around 1900, have restaurants alongside. So they've continued on this tradition of eating and drinking through the performance. But in the case of the Tivoli, they made it part of something either pre or post performance. And they also gave you the option of a private dining room if you were having that kind of an evening and needed a bit of privacy afterwards. Um, and it was a really fun space. It would normally have a mixed bill. You'd have a range of performers coming on the stage. You might have some comic singers. You might have a juggler. You might have a circus act. Um, you were going for a variety of entertainments and you would expect it to be a fun, varied night out. And although um, the performers would have a green room and dressing rooms, those would often be shared spaces because many of those performers were traveling from venue to venue across the capital overnight. So they do performance at one venue, then they get in a carriage and go to the next, probably in their costume. Um, but Kitty Lord, judging by the quality and variety of her costumes and also the fact that she ended up touring internationally, was quite high up the tree and would be somewhere where a sort of musical would seek her out and want her to be on the bill. Um, and obviously she'd be a fun person to have in the back of your cab if she was traveling from venue to venue. Um, so what I wanted to start before I get deep into her costumes was very, very quickly talk you through where her costumes are coming from, what's shaping them. So as with the musical, costume is evolving over this time period and certain costuming conventions are becoming sort of cemented within the public consciousness. And much of what you'll see in Kitty Lord's costumes comes from a genre called burlesque, which was sort of sending up popular operas and plays. It would be for a sort of middle to upper class audience who knew the, par the, the thing being parodied. But what was associated with it was a certain level of license in terms of costuming practices and what I like to call sort of strategic revelations of certain parts of the body. So as many of you will already know, it was quite okay to show quite a, a substantial proportion of the decolletage in the 19th century, but the leg and the, even the ankle was something we tended to keep concealed at the time. But in the burlesque, a lot of the leg was on display deliberately, and there was a lot of um, cross-dressing, deliberate cross-dressing. And you see it in both the music halls and the Gaiety Theatre, which was another venue that sort of crossed over between the pantomimes, the music hall, and that kind of genre of costuming. Um, you see, so here we have Kate Vaughan, who was known for showing a nice bit of leg, as was Nellie Farron, here in Principal Boy costume. 
And what Kitty Law's costume does is unite elements of the burlesque with this principal boy outfit that you saw in the pantomimes, as you can see here. So we have Connie Gilchrist on the left here. Here we have Farron again. Both of these two were stars of the Gaiety Theatre. And then we have a costume design from Wilhelm for a principal boy. So all of these costumes, they show nothing of the décolletage, which we might consider more scandalous now, but a lot of the leg. And in both instances, maybe less so with Gilchrist, but definitely with Farron, we've got a voluptuous thigh going on. We need a lot of meat around that thigh for a 19th century audience. That's a very attractive look at the time. And what I find fascinating about these costumes, and I hope you'll feel the same, is that there's a very clear link between the silhouette of the costume and the fashionable silhouette of the period. And I would, if I had all the time in the world, I would take you through the silhouettes of the costumes on the stage and the corsetry that's going on. But just for ease and quickness, here's Gilchrist in the middle. And here are a series of corsets from around the same time period. And also, I think even as, as importantly, the dresses that would go over the top. And in my mind, at least, there's a real conscious referencing of the silhouettes that many of the male members of the audience and the female members of the audience are used to seeing that sort of fashionable silhouette but taking away the skirts so they're saying to the audience this is what you fantasize about this is what's underneath and here it is right in front of you up on stage but you have to present it appropriately and you have to present it in a way that means your legs look to best advantage and lord was definitely an expert at this um, there are at least three versions of her costumes that survive in the Museum of London, and I was so fortunate to have a chance to see these. It was one of the last museum collections I visited before the first lockdown in the UK, and I remember it vividly. Um, and what is interesting about Lord's costumes in terms of how the costuming practices have evolved is that if you look back to Gilchrist and Farron, they have these, particularly obvious with Farron, is they have these shorts underneath their costumes. But by the time you get to, Far um, to Lord, sorry, the shorts have completely disappeared and that costume has no weight at the hem. So I think maybe the cloak that you sometimes see her with may have been there for modesty, but how concerned she was with modesty, I can't be certain. Again, this is why I really want to know more about how dynamic her act was, whether she moved around while she was singing or kept relatively still and allowed people to imagine what might happen should the costume ride up. Another feature that's key to her costume as well as that tunic echoing the silhouette of dress from the sort of 1900s is this central pouch sort of it's it's almost like a little purse and what was drawn to my attention is that it where it's positioned obviously the groin and also a potential link to ironically a chastity belt and the lock at the center of a chastity belt again this is all hypothesis and theory but i think it's very consciously placed and it features in as you'll see in the pictures in in all her outfits that's that same um, belt and she has it in various colorways. This pink one is the one you, I think, that maps across to many of her outfits because you also see the boots in the Museum of London in, in many of the photographs, but there's also a yellow version. All of them covered with these glorious spangles and cut glass jewels. Bear in mind, this is on stage under lighting at a distance you need to sparkle. Um, and as you can see, the thighs are consistently large but what I noticed when I looked at the costumes is not all the tights she wore had padding, only those padded symmetricals that I will come back to, I promise, had the padding. Some of the tights that she wore are just silk knitted tights that I've seen for many theatre performances. And the padded symmetricals I noticed had the least level of wear, which is really unusual for theatre costumes. Most of the tights you look at, there's a lot of sweat damage, the toes are all um, stained and darned. The padded symmetricals are almost perfect condition. So either she had a lot of them and did wear them on the stage a lot, or she definitely wore them for publicity photographs. But maybe when she was performing, she didn't always wear them on stage. And again, I need to do more research or just try and find somewhere a little bit of gold dust that tells me what was actually going on with those padded symmetricals. But either way, when she's presenting herself in a more permanent form to the public and sharing her image, she's very careful to ensure her legs look large in all the right places. She's also very careful how she appears when she's out of costume. So these two images here, this isn't Lord in the center, but this one to the left and here on the right hand side are her in and out of costume. Again, the why I've put them in here is because they're consciously referencing that subconscious connection between the underwear 
and the outerwear that you're seeing on the stage. So the fact that those stage costumes echo the line of the silhouette. In the case of Lord, by the time she's at the peak of her career, it's the S-bend corset that they need to reference with the silhouette of her costume. And if you look carefully at the image of her on the right-hand side with her arms folded, you can see that line of the S-bend corset, even though the tunic is relatively loose. And in this image here, very deliberately echoing the S-bend corset, and the reason I put this one in is that she's wearing the chemise that would go underneath the corset here. So she's, she's showing everyone all the layers of her costumes. So to turn finally, as I move towards the end of my paper to those symmetricals, I wanted to show you them close up so you can really see that padding in detail. And I wanted to talk a bit about where she may have purchased them and her engagement with symmetricals as opposed to other performers at the time. So as I've said, and I hope, established through the range of costumes that Lord has, she's high up the tree of musical performers at the time. She can afford these beautiful different colorways of outfits. There's a yellow one, there's a green one, there's this pink one, and she's also got some purples that come in. She's got this stunning pair of Reigns boots, which I'm sure many of us would happily wear today, as long as we didn't have to walk too far. And Reigns are an important name here because Reigns who made these shoes and other shoes of Lords that are in the collection also were known for making high quality symmetricals, which were sold to stars. So my surmise is that it's very likely given the quality of Lords symmetricals that she bought them from Reigns at the same time as she was buying her shoes. But less fortunate performers, and excuse the long quote here, the reason it's there is so you can read it whilst I'm rabbiting on because it's such a beautiful story. Um, but less fortunate performers, such as the one described here by Gertrude Laurent, her mother, who were performing sort of in the chorus of, in this case, Babes in the Wood at the Brixton Theatre, and who had a smaller budget, might well have to make their own symmetricals. So what is being described in this long passage here is that she's saying how her mother got a job in Babes in the Wood, and she was very lucky when she was being cast for the production that they just listened to her voice and looked at her pleasing curves, but didn't ask her to lift her skirts to show her legs, because if they had, they'd have seen the legs do not live up to the curves above the waist. And so what the wardrobe mistress did is gave her the flesh colored tights that everyone would be wearing, and then instructed her daughter how to pad them. And so she describes her being stood on top of a chair and how they carefully had to position the padding inside to get that perfectly rounded silhouette. And as she concludes, and I think is, is a really telling part of this narrative, it's not necessarily the face that makes people's fortune during this period, it's actually the legs that you're seeing underneath. And possibly because the legs were such a forbidden erogenous zone during this period. Um, so, I thought I'd conclude with the thought about you know, how attractive legs are during this period. And the quote here from Entwistle and Wilson, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. The reason I've put it here is because what fascinates me about 19th century costume is how much it can tell us about social and cultural preconceptions about the body, and particularly performers' bodies on the stage. In this case, I've talked about gender and erogenous zones, but you can think about race, you can think about class. So much is hidden in these costuming conventions. And I hope I've encourage some of you to think more about that today. Thank you for indulging me into this little journey into Lord's wardrobe and um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you so much. And I'm going to stop sharing now and pass over to Suzanne, I think. Thank you, Veronica. That was absolutely fantastic. I love your research. I love the images. I love the clothes that you get to see when you're researching. And that was such an amazing story. Um, so thank you for people to everyone for putting their questions in the chat. We'll have about five minutes of questions now and I'll read some of them out. Apologies if I don't get round to everyone's. I, I want to start with Hillary, who says, why were they called symmetricals? Oh God, that's such a good question. I, I'm going to be honest and say, I don't know. Um, I don't know if, it, if I was guessing, it would be because of how important it is to make your body look symmetrical and get that padding right. But that's pure guessing. And again, it's something that would be really interesting to look into in terms of etymology and where that, that term has come from. Because it's the consistent term in the, the advertising literature, in the books about when there's a description of a of a costume ball and a really quite 
mean, shall we say, a obnoxious reviewer of the ball sort of reporting for society says, oh, and you can tell that many of those more attractive ladies had relied on symmetricals to get their legs looking quite so perfect, and the men too, as well. But yeah, really good question. And the, the honest answer is I, I don't know. Can I just, do you think it would be because you could adjust the padding to make your legs look symmetrical? So if you had a thin thigh, really and a thin thigh, you could just kind of, you know, buffer yeah. it out. And another actors were padding their legs. I mean, Irving, Irving padded his legs for a while until Terry changed his mind. Wow. Um, a question, a question and comment from Carolina. She says she wonders if the padding restricted movement at all and hence why they may have been reserved for photos. Again, this is this is something I really, really want to test out, to be honest. I want to put someone in a pair of symmetricals and see how far they can move. They, When I was manipulating them, obviously very gently, very carefully, they weren't stiff. It's really soft, fleecy padding. It's the uh, one question someone asked me that I think is very important is how hot they might be um, under lighting, because it is quite a thick layer, um, but they are, they're soft, it's very malleable. Um, and because they're knitted anyway, it, it shouldn't restrict your movement too much. But that's pure. Again, I haven't put it on a body. I haven't asked someone to move in them. Um, the people who were wearing them tended to be doing maybe the most they'd be doing is flicking a leg in the air or maybe standing with a hand on a hip. So they're not sort of pirouetting and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So just a couple more. Um, Stephanie says, can you think of any crossovers from stage to life from these stylings? And she talks about the Merry Widow hats, for example. Oh, you mean sort of the intersection between fashionable dress and dress on the stage? Um, I mean, the costume balls are the obvious intersection where you see, so where members of the public would be familiar with the idea of padding and getting symmetricals to get your legs looking good. But in terms of fashionable dress directly influenced by Lord's costumes, Hers are, are very stylized, apart from, you could say, like, the Mary Widow hat is a good example of maybe a connection because the mm -hmm. hats that Lord, are wear, Lord is wearing, you could wear on the street. Um, but Lucille's costumes, those kind of productions are more for what music hall would evolve into, which were the musical comedies, where essentially they became fashion shows and you'd see couture on the stage. So you don't really tend to see couture on musical stages. It might nod to fashionable dress, but those musical comedies were for a more respectable audience with the purse to buy that couture costuming. The best person to read about it is, um, the best book to read about it, sorry, is Oscar Wilde to the Suffragettes by Kaplan and Stoll, which I'm sure you know, Suzanne. Um, also, Chris Bruard has done some great work on mm -hmm. those kind of costuming conventions, and he's the one who did some good work into Kitty Lord's um, a purchasing of her costumes and where I found out about that connection to Reigns. Um, so yeah, there, there is overlap, but not to the same extent as would happen from sort of 1900 onwards with the musical comedies. Brilliant, thank you. And just one final question from Melanie, and this is really fascinating. She says, wondering on a more practical purpose, so she's talking about the belt, the dangle, was this used to allow her to perform regardless of the time of the month? I hadn't considered that. Um, again, it's something that people have, it's so rarely written down, what happens yeah. when you are menstruating and how you deal with that. Um, I think it is because she was wearing it all the time I, I, and it could move around, I think less for that purpose, but it might be an added bonus to that element of the costume. I am longing to find an actress who has talked about how do you manage performing when you are menstruating. There are people who talk about performing when you're pregnant. Obviously you don't have that problem when you're pregnant, uh, but less so about menstruation. I think um, in most cases, um, you wouldn't be wearing such a skimpy costume when you were going blank. You'd probably schedule your bookings accordingly, but I don't know is the honest answer. Thank you so much, Veronica. A big round of applause for you for that. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm, as Robin stepped away, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Hey, I'm back, Suzanne. Oh, you're back. I missed Thank it. You. I missed it. No, that's okay. And actually, I'm so glad that was the last question because it was kind of mine, but I was more kind of on the whole. It seems like that draws attention to the area of that panel and that especially the detail you showed with the little fuzzy I don't know that shape. There was something very like, look here, hair, there's hair under here. I don't know. <laughs> I was just, I was sort of thinking that. 
So that's brilliant. Um, yeah, Anna Von Kat is our next speaker, who again is very lovely, as everybody is here, as I said. Um, Anna is a senior lecturer formerly at the Universities of Brighton and Sussex, a cultural dress historian. Her special interests lie in textiles and dress in the 19th century cotton and especially gingham clothing, the signification of ethical and political dress, the humanitarian work of Quaker women, and clothing worn by abolitionists and the enslaved. In 2012, she completed her PhD and her ongoing research focuses on gingham cotton production in Carlisle, cotton boycotts, and free labor cotton cloth. Um, publications include chapters in, uh, we can put it in the text, in New Critical Studies on Quaker Women, Clothing in the Enslaved in 18th Century Atlantic World, and Quakers and, and Abolition. I'm giving short titles there. Um, so today we are going to hear about home sewing underclothes by those of a thrifty disposition in the 1850s. Okay. I just want to say quickly, someone has requested live transcription, and it's not something we've used here. Um, so I'm not quite sure how it will work. But if you want to message me, and we can, and if you need it, we can give it a go. So go ahead, okay. Anna. Sorry. Thank you, Robin. Um, am I sharing the right PowerPoint? <laughs> Yay! Looks good. Yep. <laughs> With a heart-stopping moment, you wonder what you're actually sharing. Okay, so. I'm going to start with an article published in the English Woman's Domestic Magazine entitled Economy of Dress, informing concerned readers in times of rising costs of living and spiraling inflation, how to sew a set of new undergarments at a very reasonable cost. But practical advice wasn't the only objective in this staunchly middle class and somewhat didactic periodical, for it enters the debate about what is right and proper for a lady to wear. And there is, as we shall see, a, a distinctly moral tone throughout. The message is, even when she can afford alternatives, plain homemade underwear was always morally superior. I'm going to move on to the advice given in the Workwoman's Guide, a needlecraft's manual published in 1838, but still in circulation um, in the 1850s, written with moral housewifery at its heart. And I'm going to end with some slides of Quaker underclothing, showing how moral values were enacted in the wardrobes of one family, the Clarks of Street in Somerset, of the shoemaking um, fame and fortune. And this was part of my PhD research. And here you can see Eleanor, who was my focus. So I'm going to take you into the private world of everyday necessary practical sewing, both the magazine and the advice guide reinforced the gender stereotype. This was definitely a woman's world. Sewing was not simply a matter of practical need, however. It also provided the arena for bigger social agendas. It was how women marked their industriousness, their usefulness, their skill and their taste. In short, how they negotiated and navigated their personal and social identities. And here you can see a very wealthy woman, I mean, a stupendously wealthy woman, who didn't need to sew. And she's recorded in her photograph, busy with some handicrafts. Are we advancing? Oh no, it's not advancing. Give yes, another go, Anna. If not, I'll share my screen with you. This happens with me on Zoom. I don't know what it is. Wait a minute. I'm sorry, I can't do it. It's all fine. I have it. <laughs> Thank We're you. all good. Look at this, the magic of Zoom. Did you oh, want the next slide, Anna? Thank yeah. you, Monica. Thank you so much. I'll try not to cry. Okay, so the article appeared in the 1858 to 9 edition of the English Woman's Domestic Magazine. And this magazine, as I'm sure we're all aware, is pitched at female homemakers. It was first published by Isabella and Samuel Beaton in 1852 with a readership of um, 50,000 by the 1870s. So really popular. Earlier in the same edition, um, a correspondent wrote in requesting a column on expenditure on clothing, observing there are many books on household expenses, but I have never seen one on the expenses of dress. What must be spent on underclothes and shoes? How long such articles might last? Next slide, please. 
So this article, The Economy of Dress, which you can see on the left-hand side in full, it's, um, it's not very long, but it, it does give some very uh, specific advice. It begins with a statement, uh, the cost for female apparel is not nearly as much as many suppose. And it recommends readers start with the most important part, namely the undergarments, the underclothing, which at this moment in time, as we all know, is very copious, lots and lots of layers to protect um, both corsetry and gowns from um, perspiration mainly. It says a lady can make a set of six drawers, chemises, petticoats and night dresses for the small sum of one pound, 18 shillings and a half penny. And I think the half penny is so important. It really does track this as being something pertaining to those really keeping their costs under control. Using a particularly durable cotton cloth, a form of calico, unbleached, it was known as a long cloth, and it was made by the famous Manchester company Horrocks's. Next slide, please. Thank you. It gives practical tips, but interestingly, not the actual patterns on cutting out and numbering all the pieces at the same time. In this way, you get less wastage. You can tuck in bands um, and little pieces in amongst the larger pattern pieces. Marking all items for laundry with embroidered red threads rather than ink, which it proclaims the invention of the idol. The set of six, of six items of each, uh, six of each item was sufficient to last two weeks, and that is the recommended interval for laundry in middle class homes. Poorer homes obviously had to wash more frequently. The very wealthy, uh, it was kind of a matter of status to only do it every six weeks or so. Next slide, please. It suggests wearing them in rotation to get a good four or five years wear out of them. And on embellishment, it's very specific. It advises, I am of the opinion that the less trimming, trimming there is on under linen, the more ladylike it appears. A line of simple and elegant crochet edging was deemed perfectly sufficient. Next slide, please. It castigates those who say they don't have time to make all these garments and you've got, it must be emphasised, these are made by hand. Yes, the sewing machine was available at this time, but not really to middle class households. Um, so this is a matter of home sewing and long, plain home sewing, long, long seams. And they suggest that um, women rise an hour earlier for the purpose and always have some at hand to take up any spare minute that may occur during the, the day. Above all, it regards home sewing far better than putting out for dressmakers, um, regard, uh, referring to dressmakers as their suffering sisters, which I think is a really interesting moral perspective on conditions of labour and how morally appropriate it was to have other people doing your work, how self-sufficient you should be. Next slide, please. Thank you. Running through all the magazine's discussions of feminine fashion is a strong moral thread. Purity, finery and danger are deeply entwined. The, the periodical prides itself in promoting prudent, good taste, and it really is, is very critical of the excessive love of finery, which it claims is ruining hundreds of lives. And it, it mentions this underneath this um, illustration of a, a crinoline lady who's quite sort of excessively attired in the magazine's opinion. The readers worried about being able to maintain a respectable wardrobe, it agrees that times are hard. In the same volume, it asks, can we live on 300 pounds a year? And the conclusion was uh, no. What used to be achievable on 20 to 30 pounds now costs considerably more. This was clearly a delicate balancing act the importance of maintaining a respectable outer wardrobe supported by good underclothes was uppermost in readers' minds. For as the magazine stated, dress acts as a sort of personal glossary, a species of symbolical language, which would be madness to neglect. Next slide, please. So the plain advice offered by the English Woman's Domestic Magazine chimes with an earlier publication, The Workwoman's Guide, and you can see it's got an incredibly long title. The Workwoman's Guide containing instructions to the inexperienced in cutting out and completing those articles of wearing apparel, etc. 
which are usually made at home, also an explanation of upholstery, straw plaiting, bonnet making, knitting, etc. And it has the strap line, a method shortens labour. And this was published by a lady in 1838 and still in circulation 20 years later. And you can buy a reprint of it on Amazon. In the preface of the Workwoman's Guide, um, it, it makes it very clear that it's aimed at all ladies, but especially those of a thrifty disposition. It states that it will be useful to rich ladies sewing for charity, clergymen's wives, young married women, school mistresses, and ladies' maids. And unusually, it has a chapter on Quaker sewing, which is really interesting because Quaker sewing is very mysterious. Um, we feel that it's a matter of being passed from mother to daughter, there was very little in the way of published advice on what shape the garments should be or how they should be made up. It offers both practical and moral advice on the very serious subject of dress regarding skills in home dressmaking as paramount in keeping up appearances. And throughout the book, there is a strong message of waste not, want not, and cutting your cloak to, cloth, uh, sorry, your coat to fit your cloth. Tellingly, it observes that the poor lack even the most basic skills, leading to, and I quote, an extravagance and waste amongst women of a humble class that forces them to squander, squander their scanty budget on dressmakers, so ill-advised. Next slide, please. The advice of thrift and modesty rang true with Quaker women. And here are some slides of Quaker women's underclothes that once belonged to the exceedingly wealthy women of the Clark family, those of a thrifty disposition, you could argue. These women could well afford the very best that money could buy, but we can see that they chose very simple, utilitarian and unadorned items. And more importantly, these have been retained and kept in the family archive, which is held in, in Somerset and Street. So here we've got a plain cotton shift with deep slits, the ribbon ties, Next slide, please. And here we've got a very plain pair of drawers. Very simple and there's almost no adornment at all. I'm sorry these images aren't very good. These were taken a while ago before we had cameras on our phones and they're actually not that great, are they? Next slide. So here we're going a little later into the century. We've got an all-in-one cami knicker set which has got a little more lace, but it's still, yeah, it's, it's fairly, fairly austere in its style. And the last slide, now this really isn't a very good slide, very bleached, but you can see a very simple um, nightdress and it has that simple line of crochet that's advocated in the press and also a little blue ribbon, which is very ubiquitous. So to conclude, moral dressmaking, as I like to call it, was promoted to women and this shaped attitudes to their undergarments. In the case of Eleanor, whom we saw at the beginning, simplicity was taken to extremes. Not only did she possess strikingly few items of clothing, she didn't actually have enough items to distribute amongst her daughters. And this is the wife of the largest employer in the West of England, so it's really interesting. She advocated the use of exceedingly plain materials, including shoddy cloth, a form of recycled wool made from shredded rags collected on the streets, worn by the very poor. And this was made up with uh, fresh wool. Whether this can be explained as pauperist attitudes, possibly to assuage capitalistic guilt, or whether these were matters of Eleanor's personal taste, is the subject of my ongoing research and I welcome any questions on this. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you for taking us into your research. It's just so wonderful to see you know, us. Many of us have been estranged from research materials, so it's just wonderful to see you engage with yours. Um, we so we have some questions, and lovely comments for you. Um, let's start with how were ribbons used in the deep slit? So you showed the first shift that you showed that you had some slits, I think, around the shoulder area. 
Well, I wish I could tell you. All I can do is sort of look at this slightly orphan, slightly incomplete garment. Um, I, all I can imagine is that some sort of drawstring is used to pull it through. But I agree. I mean, they're, they're very big, those slits. The simple answer is, I don't know. <laughs> Does anyone else know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, one from Hillary. Given that a little lace or crochet was seen as ladylike and the decoration on plain Quaker dress is present but matches the recommendation, what do you think too much would have been or was or what was too much in a Quaker context? Well, I think looking from looking at the extant garments in the Alfred Gillett Trust and also in York Museum's collection and also Friends House Library in London, there really is so little embellishment um, up until the third quarter of the 19th century that you know you can't really can't really talk about it. It, it just isn't there. There is absolutely nothing. Uh, other than reinforcing seams and attaching ties, um, there's very little. However, and if Hannah Rumble was here, she could tell us a lot more about this because this is her real specialism. The advices on plainness were shifting quite substantially from the about sort of 1856 onwards. So by the time we get to the 1890s, there is a much more kind of liberal and less... Um, didactic approach to Quaker dress and there's a much more sort of outward facing mood within the religious society of friends but that's not to say everybody subscribed to it so I would imagine that well I know this because my Quaker relatives uh, they don't like embroidery they don't like lace they like things to be very plain indeed and everything else is seen as frankly a little showy. Wow that's so interesting <laughs> um okay that there are some to return back to the slits um the two comments here one from jill salen who says the slits would allow the flap to fall down over the corset edges oh, of course but, yes, <laughs> <you>. of course <laughs> and caroline ness wondered if the, um the large slits would have been for maternity wear or breastfeeding oh, i'm but, so silly thank you jill you've totally put me right yes yeah okay um, and it just let's have another question here from Alison. Do you have an idea how long it would take to make the garments recommended in the magazine? And she says, thank you for the interesting presentation. Um, someone has done a calculation. I, Hilary, do you know somebody has worked out how many hours it takes to make a shift? I, I know what you mean, but I can't recall <laughs> off the top of my head where it is or, or who did I it. I think it was Alden. Alden did oh. it. Yes, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yes. It's it's recorded, it will be uploaded soon. Yeah. I mean it would take me a very long time. <laughs> I wouldn't attempt it. Especially as you say, sewing by hand as well, you know, not no machine mm. available. Mm -hmm. Um okay. Um just so just kind of to round up the questions here. There's lots of lovely comments Actually, for you, Anna. Um just as a day says, um Anna, have you ever considered becoming a narrator for audiobooks? And she says she could listen to you all day. <laughs> oh, bless you. Well, I did have a very funny comment that um, this was at Costume Colloquium a few years ago, and I, I gave a paper, and someone in the audience asked the question, would you read me a bedtime story? <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was very sweet. Very yes. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thanks for all of the questions. I'm just I'm peeking at the time and we probably need to roll on. There was also a, a earlier question about um, uh, vintage fashion. And as you scroll up a bit, there might be something you can answer in the chat about that too, asking about. Um, yeah. Uh, but we need to move on to our next lovely speaker of the day. And that is Hilary Davidson. Um, Hilary is a dress historian and curator based between Sydney and London. She was curator of fashion and decorative arts at the Museum of London and has lectured, broadcast, and taught extensively in her field, including presenting on the BBC documentary Pride and Prejudice, Having a Ball. She's a consultant on historic textiles for the Oxford English Dictionary. 
and an honorary associate of the University of Sydney. I think we all know Hillary's work in this era in all of in her um, Jane Austen area. Her reconstruction of Jane Austen's police coat led to an extensive study of British Regency dress, published as Dress in the Age of Jane Austen. And she's currently working on Jane Austen's wardrobe, which we're all super excited about, amongst many other interesting projects. So Hillary is going to tell us today about one of her favorite issues. Plant, I love it. Flannel. I mean, do we need to say more than that? Flannel. Trip through Regency undergarments. Take it away. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, this presentation is purely an excuse to talk about one of my favorite things that I discovered while researching the book. And um, it all comes from this one quote from Jane Austen's novel, Sense and Sensibility, which is published in 1811. And young Marianne Dashwood, age 17, is complaining about Colonel Brandon, age 35, as being basically too old and decrepit to get married. And one of her bases for this is that he talked of flannel waistcoats. And with me, a flannel waistcoat is invariably connected with the aches, cramps, rheumatisms, and every species of ailment that can afflict the old and feeble. And as we all know, she does end up marrying him. And as Austen sort of points out at the end, uh, he does still seek, seek the constitutional safeguard of a flannel waistcoat. So in my quest for the book, in the book, I, I was thought, all right, well, what's a flannel waistcoat? And I assumed that it was going to be the kind of the red flannel, uh, woolen flannel underwear that I had been more familiar with from the later 19th century. So I was sort of quite surprised to discover that a Regency flannel waistcoat looked more like this. And a waistcoat in the usage at the time meant kind of an undershirt. And it's using the kind of the older introduction of waistcoat that always had sleeves. And so once I sort of discovered the flannel waistcoats, and this is one of the ones from the banker Thomas Coots um, from the collection at the V&A, I sort of saw them everywhere. And I'm just going to run you through some of the wonderful world of flannel underwear that I feel has been underregarded in histories of dress of this period. My research will go a little bit earlier and later, but this is kind of the core of something that I just want to keep working on um, because I think it's really interesting. So the only article I found that really addresses flannel underwear directly is the wonderful Linda Baumgarten's um, Under Waistcoats and Drawers. And she talks a lot about this kind of slip under waistcoat that you wore so that the collar was visible, but it's like an extra layer of warmth going underneath your um, uh, your outer waistcoat. So when we're talking about flannel waistcoats, it could be this, uh, but then under waistcoat, but without that qualifying under, it's generally more like a shirt. And these, once you start looking for them, you find them a lot. And I actually really love the fact that these examples are stained, they're worn, worn. This is not fashionable clothing. This is really comfortable, practical clothing. And they generally, for the men's examples, generally have this kind of quite simple T shape. They open down the front um, and generally have a the bands down the front made of. Um, taffeta or some other kind of silk with a thread button and you can just about see up here sometimes they're fluffy on the inside very much like Veronica's symmetricals and there's a couple of other quotes there as well um, Jane Austen rather wonderfully calls it a disgraceful and contemptible article and she also does talk about her uncle still being in his flannels but getting better again so Marianne Dashwood is correct in that there is a um there is a connection between flannels and illness and age. It's it's sort of soft, comfortable clothing. We're very used to having jersey clothing now and the way that half the world embraced sportswear and athletic wear and athleisure during the pandemic. Flannels are kind of the Regency equivalent of that. Um, so we do find it worn, flannels sort of worn when you're, you know, old and cold or just not feeling very well and, and want to curl up. But especially in Colonel Brandon's sake, there is a whole other narrative of flannel waistcoats, which has to do with military men and um, martial effect. And my research started leading me into so many re references for um, military flannels. So this is a quote from the Duke of Clarence, the future William IV to his son, George Fitzclarence, who's just joined the army. And he's saying, you know, if you're not going in a hurry, take only what's absolutely necessary, leave all finery, boots and flannel are the best and most useful things. And once you start looking at advice to soldiers, so this is William Blair's a soldier's friend, um, you get, I mean, it's, it's, it's just full of things like woolen clothing will be found 
the best defense against the cold. Flannel drawers and under waistcoats are much preferable to linings. And you see this for advice for going to the tropics, advice for going um, in the cold, advice for going to sea. This is the flannel waistcoat of Admiral Lord Nelson with his telltale on one arm. And it flannel was seen as a wonderful thing for um, being at sea because it stays warm when it will stays warm when it's wet. And so here are some examples of um, non-martial but flannel underdrawers, uh, again from the Thomas Coots collection, cut very much like outer drawers but with those underwear thread buttons. And we must remember as well that Colonel Brandon was in the army. He is a colonel. So Austin is also playing on the military connotations of flannel. And I'll just flick quickly through two fantastic satirical images um, from 1793 about basically flannel being part of the, the war effort. Uh, flannel coats of mail against the cold or the British ladies' patriotic presence to the army. So there they, poor fellas, are being dressed up in flannel from head to toe, as they are also are here in the Gilray caricature of the same year. And once you realize that flannel is represented by this kind of creamy, yellowy color, then you start seeing it everywhere in illustrations in all sorts of ways. Uh, so, for example, both of these images, um, so this is a Rowlandson and this I think is a Gilray, but it's a satirical uh, illustration in Le Bon Ton in 1818. It looks like these gentlemen have got their shirts open to their um, waists, but if you look, you can actually see they're wearing a flannel waistcoat underneath and here as well. Um, so they were worn next to the skin. You could wear them over your shirt as well. They're washable, they're cleanable, and they're basically working like thermal underwear. And so I feel it's also a really good counterpoint to the kind of the idea of everyone in the Regency being cold um, because underneath light clothing, you can wear a warm underlayer. And this kind of, once I was alert to flannel, it is coming up everywhere. This is a wonderful flannel waistcoat um, that's an excavated piece from uh, Henry Wardle, who died aged 88 and was buried in 1840. And he was buried in his old, darned, much mended, comfy, cosy flannel waistcoat. And I'm really glad that Anna showed the Workwoman's Guide because there are Again, once you, you're alert to it, there's lots of instructions for making flannel undergarments there for men, women, and children. And I feel that Henry's example, so you can sort of see some of the patching, uh, the brown color has come from immersion in the earth, but just to compare as well, you can see the, the ring that is all that remains of what would have been the center of a thread button there as well. Um, and thread buttons survived the washing process much better. So you often see them on underwear there. Um, but there's, there's something very intimate and personal and lovely about kind of being wrapped up in your, your favorite warm garment. And you can see that this is something that's worn in life by the care of the mending and the patching that is involved. So women also wear, wore flannel underwear, and this is a little bit less documented and there is less material culture surviving for it. I would suspect because a lot of um, women's undergarments kind of get reused for, for other things. You could make infant stays with them to wrap your baby up. Uh, there are, I've seen um, accounts of, sometimes they're called waistcoats for women or just bodices, flannel, flannel bodices. So you see them as well. And you think of, you know, again, underneath those fine muslin dresses, you're wearing wool. But I love this. This is um, a poem called The Limiad. And it was written in um, 1818 by an anonymous author. And it's, it's, it's this whole kind of rollicking um, description of life at the fashionable seaside town of Lyme Regis. And I've highlighted in red here this interchange between at a ball between a sea captain and Lady Love Pound. And she's complaining that she's too hot and everyone should open the windows. And he's saying, well, you're wearing a ton of flannel underneath your clothing. She's snugly encased in her flannel chemise. And she's you know, actually wearing six flannels. So they're having a discussion in a ballroom about the fact that she is dressed to the nines underneath with warm clothing. And one of my absolutely favorite images that I've used in the book here is a hint to the ladies or a visit from Dr. Flannel. And this is one of the very few representations of a flannel petticoat that I've seen. And again, 
previously I would have expected this to be the kind of bright red, but you can see it's that kind of dull beigey color as well. And the doctor's saying, you've complained of being cold about the loins. So I've stepped in with a warm flannel petticoat and the fashionable ladies go, like, I have no loins. No, no, this is too, too hideous, too unfashionable, too to contemplate back to that um, thing that Veronica brought up of legs being um, unmentionable. And just to finish off here as well, I want to, I think Austin is also connoting a third intimation when she has um, Marianne bring up Colonel Dashwood's flannel waistcoat. She never does anything unintentionally. And this is a quote from Lord Chesterfield's very famous letters to his son, published in 1774, where he's talking about matrimony. And he says that um, old debauchees shouldn't take a blooming beauty to their bosom when an additional flannel waistcoat would have been a bedfellow much more salutary and appropriate. So I think she's having actually the slyest, slyest dig at the age difference between Brandon and Marianne because he has a flannel waistcoat, but he still takes a blooming beauty to his bosom. So on that note, I will end and um, thank you for letting me talk about flannel, which is um, something very dear to my heart. Thanks. Thank you, Hilary. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it's really interesting to see how you take Colonel Brandon's waistcoat and then it takes you on this exciting research journey. Um, so we have lots of questions and comments for you in the chat. The first one is from a few people and it relates to the flannel. Um, if you could give a definition of what the makeup of the textile fan, flannel was at this time? It's almost um, exclusively wool. I've never seen any with a cotton um, makeup in it as well. And the wool is of varying qualities of fineness. The flannel itself is, it's a kind of a slightly loose plain weave. And then it's usually got quite a fuzzy nap. So any gaps in the weave are taken up by the fuzz of the nap. So it has a slight insulating quality there as well. A lot of the flannel waistcoats that I've seen have like a fluffy inside in them. And I think that is actually woven in. So it's woven and raised nap, very much like polar fleece now. Um, but then it's got like the, the plane on the outside. I have also seen kind of jersey, uh, so wool jersey with a fluffy inside. So again, not quite flannel because flannel is a plain weave textile, but still giving that kind of stretchy plain quality. Thank you, Hilary. Um, Jill, Sarah and Anna were interested in that question. Um, Nikki asks if the waistcoats were open in the armpits. That's a good question. Um, I, ooh, I've looked at a lot up close and, you know, I think they are. I think there's a slight slit and then it's bound with um, kind of it, it finishes up as about a uh, quarter of an inch wide ribbon on each side um, just to give it kind of give a bit more movement. But I can have a look at my pictures and, and confirm that. OK, thank you. Um, Alicia is interested in the word flannel and she wonders if there's a link to the term like your people say you're talking a load of flannel or things like that. That's interesting. I haven't followed up that link. It might be that flannel is kind of fluffy and takes up a lot of space. So maybe it's it's connected with that. You're just talking, you know, like cotton wool, basically. Yeah, thank you. Um, and there's some comments on the colour of the fabric as well. Asaday wonders if that flesh colour was so that it could be worn under layers. I think it's one of, I, as far as I understand, it's kind of unbleached white wool. So again, it makes it quite, it's it's cheaper. You don't have to then process it further once if you've got a sheep of the, the right colour. Um, it, but it can, it can also be worn underneath linen, underneath cotton, and it's not so visible. And of course, on white skin, or for you know, white skinned people, it's nearer to that flesh colour. Um, so I think that might have been something of its sort of invisibility as well, hiding underneath um, a lot of a lot of dress. Thank you. One from Kim, who asks, who wonders what the relationship is, if any, between flannel, wool and dress reformers. 
I would say that people like, say, Dr. Jaeger, who's just, you know, wear wool all the time and, you know, in everything, it's very much coming from this flannel protects you from all ills. Flannel is, you know, once you read the doctor's advice to the army, it's very much, it wicks away perspiration. And if you're in the tropics, you should still wear flannel because it's going to get all noxious vapors away from your body and keep you in good health. So I think it very much has that kind of health dimension as well. Um, the fact that it's warm but washable is also really key and a lot of the instructions are saying it's great but you do have to wash it a lot you have to make sure it's clean I've got records of say fellas in London sending their flannel waistcoats home to their mum to wash um, so yeah there's 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 definitely a health dimension to it it not only looks after you when you're sick but it, it's prophylactic it stops you from from getting sick yeah brilliant thank you so much Hilary the other um things in the chat they're lovely comments so i'll let you read those but thank you so much for that thank you to everyone for their questions and i'll pass you back to robin now thank you suzanne yeah i was wondering uh, imagine that kim and i wondering the same sort of thing about that but um also the the dye i when I, what as asked about it, i was thinking about dye leaching out on the, when you're wearing something that's close to the skin but then i realized i don't actually know how much how many undergarments might be dyed and that uh, so i'm throwing that out more generally as maybe because i'm like how many how many undergarments are actually dyed in color you know out there would it would be you're wearing something close would you be dyeing your skin as you sweat as well Randy. well that's i mean the the issue of red um obviously alison matthews david has looked at what happens with red dyes and stockings and toxic things there yeah. but the reason that i was expecting to find these flannel waistcoats to be red was the long-held belief that things that are colored red are actually warmer they're hotter so this is at least coming in from the early modern period so if you wear there's a lot of red wool petticoats there uh, on kirtles and so that if you wear something red it keeps the heat in and there's lots of things about put red flannel on your chest with you know goose grease or wrap um, red flannel around your throat to keep you warmer so that's why i was expecting that but i think that does have a you have to have the dyes available um, and it, it it seems to be on garments that are a little bit more garmenty than underwear. -y. Yeah, not yeah. directly in contact with your skin. That's interesting. And I'm going to go back to Alison's book and look at that. Thanks, Hillary. Um, right. So I'm just as we before we move on to our final um, short talk to hear our museum five minutes. I am putting a couple bits in the chat. Um, we are planning our talks for the coming year. So there's some links here for at homes. Uh, if you are interested in doing one of these, which we hope you are, um, the first link leads you to a little, a very short, like, tell us what you want to talk about form. But also we have in the last few months started doing the museum five minutes. So if you're a curator or somebody who is connected to a collection that you'd like to share information about, we love to hear about collections, especially the ones that we don't know as well. Um, and we welcome you to come talk. And that is who we're going to hear about right now. Oh, we're super excited to have the director of the Underpinnings Museum, uh, Carolina L Leskowska, I hope I said that right, Leskowska, um, here today. So it, Carolina, if you would like to go ahead and um, share your screen and tell us a little bit about the Underpinnings, we are very excited to hear it. Yes, of course I'd love to. Let me see if this will work. Is that showing? Yes, brilliant. So hello, I'm Carolina Laskowska. I'm the director of the Underpinnings Museum. The project is a digital museum dedicated to the history of underwear. There's an online archive with over 400 objects that we are adding to constantly and several free access digital exhibitions. Today, I'm going to be sharing some of my favourite 19th century garments from the collection uh, at quite uh, speed, if you'll forgive me how I rushed through. Um, there we go. So first up is this carved wooden busk. It's a sweetheart busk. These were originally used to support the center front of corsets or stays and were commonly gifted as love tokens between sweethearts. You can see in this example, we have the carved initials A and W and the uh, sweetheart motifs. Um, a detail which doesn't actually come across in the photos that I find rather lovely is that it's actually curved so it would work a lot better with human anatomy than a flat piece of wood. And next we have this cross stitch and silk ribbon garter. 
So before suspender belts were invented, garters were used to hold up stockings for people of all genders. Most of them were very simply constructed with a simple band of decorative fabric with ribbon ties. This would have originally been part of a pair and it's got this lovely cross stitched floral pattern um, and originally green silk ribbons that have largely now shattered. Uh, next, we have this early corset. Um, it's just an exquisite example of craftsmanship. I absolutely love this piece. It's entirely hand stitched with decorative embroidery, lots and lots of cording, particularly around the bust. Uh, if we look on the interior here, you can really see how you know, wonderfully the craft is kind of showcased. You can see how beautifully it's made, almost as beautiful as the exterior. And uh, one of my favorite details is this stamp of the original owner's name, very, very faded, but you can just about make out Julia A. Hobbing. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find any information about the original owner, but hopefully that will change one day. Next, we have this wedding garter, which was hand embroidered by Mrs. Clara Jane Rareford Brown of Five Litfield Place in Clifton for her wedding day. Now, in contrast to the earlier garter I shared, this has what was then very exciting new textile technology in the form of elastic, um, which must have been quite a lot more comfortable than a rigid ribbon tied tightly. And next is this red woolen corset. I absolutely adore the colour of this piece. Uh, this wool is still so vibrant so long, uh, such a long time later. And I really love the beautiful flossing embroidery on this piece as well, which is both decorative and functional in that it helps to secure the pieces of baleen in place. Uh, it's quite a typical 1860s silhouette in that it's very short and it has the gourd hips and bust line, but still quite a mild curve to this piece. Now we move on to the 1870s with this red cage crinolette. Uh, I, a, another piece with a gorgeous colour, with the red again, um, as Hilary mentioned, keeping the body warm, I assume was the uh, thinking behind these colours. Um, it was a lightweight method to support outer skirts without the need for lots of heavy petticoats. And this kind of has the streamlined shape that was a trans transitional period between the wider crinolines of the 1850s and onwards and the later bustles. Now, this is one of my favorite pieces in the entire museum collection and is very, very special. It's a luxurious example of a maternity corset uh, designed to be worn in pregnancy with details that allowed the wearer to adapt the piece to their changing shape. It supported the abdomen and it supported the back. So it was a piece for the wearer's comfort rather than shaping to a fashionable silhouette. Um, the vibrant silk is very, very much embellished with the flossing embroidery, the silk velvet trims, and this lovely rosette at the centre front. Now, if we look at the interior, we can see it's very heavily structured. There's around 94 pieces of baleen and several silk bones distributed throughout. I quite enjoy these details of the, um, if you see at the centre front, there is the silk satin padding for the wearer's comfort and a now kind of damaged silk velvet trim at the bottom edge as well. And next we have a uh, bust improver because when nature doesn't provide, there is always padding. The hips, uh, hip and bust pads were commonplace in the late 19th century to exaggerate the figure for a more fashionable silhouette. And this example is crafted from a delicate striped cotton with this fine lace edge and a silk ribbon tie. Oh, sorry, went a little bit too far. Uh, so this corset is one of the most restrictive and extreme silhouettes in our entire collection, which carries with it a certain irony because it comes from the Warner brand. Now, Dr. Lucien Warner's corset brand came to prominence due to his claims of offering healthy corsets as an alternative to standard corsetry that was viewed as being too restrictive uh, and was, of course, incorrectly blamed for a whole host of health maladies. Uh, now, in the later part of the 19th century, baleen was becoming increasingly scarce due to the overhunting of the baleen whale and this forced corset manufacturers to innovate. The Warner brand was renowned for using its rust-proof coralline boning 
material manufactured from the fibres of the Mexican Ishle plant. I hope I said that correctly. Uh, next, we have this adorable miniature salesman corset, which was uh, a travelling salesman's product sample. And although it's very much reduced in scale, the construction techniques, patterning and materials are almost identical to that of everyday corsets from this time period. Uh, now, finally, to round out a near century of uh, support, stocking supporting technology, we have this very luxurious pair of host supporters, um, a precursor to garter belts that were designed to be pinned onto corsets that lacked their own incorporated garters. Uh, as early elastics perished relatively quickly, it was often more prudent to use detachable straps. Uh, this example is crafted from watered silk ribbon, very fine machine lace trims, decadent silk rosettes, and gilded suspender clips that are still beautifully shiny even after all this time. That was a very small peek at our collection, all of which you can view online in a lot more detail. I hope you enjoyed that and thank you for listening. Carolina, thank you so much. Um, please look at the chat. Everyone's just swooning a oh little God. bit. I haven't been able to see everything. it while talking. Um, yeah, there's a couple questions in there about specific things that you showed that maybe you could answer in the chat. But yes, sorry, most I can't just, seem to get Zoom back up. How do I? No, that's if you stop your screen share. There you go at the bottom. So, um, but I think the most important thing though is how do we get to see these things? And Kate has asked. I think what we're all wondering is it's such an amazing collection. How are you managing it? And do you have any plans to have physical exhibitions? And actually, could you say really quickly, because this actually started as a, as a crowdfunder or a Kickstarter, or is it, it's so interesting. Okay. That's a lot of questions in one go. I'm going to yeah, try and- sorry. No, that's up. okay. Just mostly about like, how did you start and what do you want to do in the future and how can we see it? Okay. <laughs> so um, the museum was founded in 2016, following a successful crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter. Now the kind of history of the project, my background is not in academia or museums work. I'm a designer, an underwear designer, and I've always found underwear history you know, incredibly inspiring and studying objects a really, really useful resource for things like construction techniques and patterning. And I had built up um, quite a substantial collection of garments for my own reference. Now my friend, Lorraine Smith, uh, was visiting me one day and we were going through the collection and she suggested after I said as a joke that it would be a dream to open a museum one day but you know that's utterly impossible why not start it online and this was an idea that kind of had never occurred to me but we quickly realized this was possible and a really great way to connect with people and to share the collection with other people and uh, yeah we we ran the crowdfunding campaign. We teamed up with our photographer, Tiggs Rice, and um, it's just been growing ever since. So are you planning to make these available? I mean, if somebody, I'm sure there's lots of people in this room who maybe want to study some of these pieces. Um, is there a way to do that? It just to contact you or do you even allow that or? So it's of course free every object is very highly documented on our website there's contextual information you know dates materials and there's very very detailed photos on many pieces we try to get interior views construction views and so on um we unfortunately can't offer in-person study the collection is actually split across several countries and um it's held privately. We just don't have the resources to arrange kind of study trips and things like that, unfortunately. But if anyone is seeking particular information on the piece, we can, you know, offer what we can through our website and uh, maybe see if we can offer additional images and so on. Thank you so much. I think it's really, really exciting and also just um, really unique about collections. It's a very forward thinking thing because so there's so many private collections out there that are completely inaccessible. So it's wonderful that you've done this and, and shown a, a glimpse of it. And um, I'm, I think we all probably have various ideas about things going like, could you do outreach? Where is it? You know, th there's a lot going on there um, that would be really good. And actually it's kind of a good segue to, to go ahead and announce our talk for um, next month because uh, 
in the way of kind of using and um, social media as a sort of well one you're coming from as you said a, di a different background and we love that we have makers and designers who are part of this but also uh sort of navigating the online world next month we're going to have a slightly different type of at home in that we're going to have a panel discussion with three people who have made wonderful careers for themselves as dress historians largely through um, making and delivering incredible videos on YouTube. So next month, we're going to have a panel that's going to be comprised of Abby Cox, Bernadette Banner, and Cheney McKnight of Not Your Mama's History. And I'm super excited they've all agreed to join us because I think particularly for those of us who teach and are thinking about our students and different modes of sort of delivery and dissemination, it will be fascinating for all of us. Um, we do expect this to be quite a popular one because they all have literally thousands of followers on YouTube. And so we will be opening up registration to our network first <laughs> before we announce it more widely and share it. And so just in case you are not subscribed to our listserv, please go click the link that I just put in the chat and make sure that you're signed up because I should have this event bright set up this week and send out registration and we're going to leave it open just for the network for a few days before it gets promoted more widely. Um, and the time, we're just pinning down the time. Uh, two of them are on the East Coast of the state. So we just wanna make sure that we'll, that this time still suits. We might have it slightly later. Um, as you know, we do like to be flexible with our time to accommodate an international audience. And we do, we are thinking about more of that going forward. We want to make sure um, that we expand what we're doing in our network. And so our call is out. Like I said, I put it out, I put it earlier in the chat and we're definitely looking for um, new papers and we're especially interested in certain subject areas, uh, non-Western, non-European. We'd love to hear more about that. We actually haven't heard that much about men either um, for a change. Uh, <laughs> so we're, we're welcoming um, talks in that area too. Veronica, did you wanna add? something or do you have no fewer oh i'm just looking over and i thought no, i'm just i'm nodding in agreement oh good <laughs> okay so <laughs> nod. you know the act of like yes i'm listening <laughs> that's great so we've we're slightly past our end time but we are welcome to stay here for a minute if there's some extra questions but i will wrap it up officially at this point um i'd like to thank all of our speakers today it was fantastic we've had a wonderful turnout i think at the height we had just 70 or so people here so that's brilliant um and uh thank you all for coming and spending some time with us on I think it's still Sunday for the most part for everybody here, whatever time it is for you. Um, and it was wonderful to have you and we hope to see you next month. So thanks very much. And we can, yeah, that's great. And I'll stop the recording. <laughs>